Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, my name's uh, Tom Knockholds, and I'll be running most of the webinar tonight. Assisting me tonight is, is Nikki. Nikki Eisen, put your head in here, Nikki, and say hello. Hi, everyone. Um, Nikki will be jumping in and making contributions throughout this webinar as well. So a little bit of housekeeping to kick things off. We're going to take questions um, and answers. Well, we're going to have a question and answer section at the end of this webinar. Um, but if you have any questions which are about comprehension or understanding what we're saying, please do post them into the question chat panel and we'll endeavour to answer those as we go. Um, we're also recording this webinar um, and we'll be publishing a recording um, at a later date. So if you, if you can't stick around for the whole thing or um, you know someone that wasn't able to make it, just rest assured that we'll be making this available later. So this uh, webinar is the first in a, in a series that uh, the Coalition for Community Energy is hosting. Um, it's starting tonight and running all the way through September, October, November, even the first week in December. And that's a total of 14, 14 webinars in total. So we're really excited for the, for, the, for the first series of C4C sponsored webinars to take place um, this year and hopefully we can make it a standing feature of, of what it is that the, the Coalition for Community Energy does. So we're going to get started and basically we're going to want to start by, talk, by giving you a bit of a background um, as to where the, I'm going to turn my video off, a bit of background as to where this, um, where this small scale this small scale community solar guide came from. Um, and I'm actually gonna hand over to Nikki to, to do the explaining on this one. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so the small scale community solar guide was uh, one of many resources developed as part of the National Community Energy Strategy. The National Community Energy Strategy was a project uh, led by the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS, uh, funded by ARENA, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and with partners including Embark, Alternative Technology Association, Community Power Agency, uh, Total Environment Centre, um, Starfish Initiatives, and a couple more. And uh, it was really one of the key precursor documents and processes that led to the formation of the Coalition for Community Energy. So the first National Community, uh, the first Community Energy Congress, uh, which you can see on the photo uh, on the front page of the strategy, uh, was held with funding from the, the development of the National Community Energy Strategy, so, and was part of the development process. So uh, we launched the strategy a bit after that Congress uh, in early 2015, and we'd got some extension material, some uh, funding not only to develop a strategy and a plan for how to grow the community energy sector in Australia, um, which was a plan which included five uh, sub-strategies, uh, one on models, and this uh, guide is really pertinent to that. Second on funding and finance, the third on capacity building, this guide is also pertinent to capacity building. Uh, fourthly, profile raising and stakeholder support, and finally, policy and regulatory reform. If you haven't seen the National Community Energy Strategy, I really recommend you check it out. You can find it at C4CE net.net.au forward slash NCES. Anyway, um, as part of the national strategy, there were a number of additional documents and resources that were developed. And the first edition of this small scale community solar guides is one such resource. It was Appendix E, which can give you a sense of how many different resources there were. Um, and it was led by ISF with collaborators, including Embark, Repower, Shoalhaven, Moreland Energy Foundation, Clear Skies and Starfish Initiatives. And it came out of a workshop between the community energy groups and uh, ISF, the community energy groups that had successfully or almost successfully gotten their first community solar project across the line. So this was back at the end of 2004. We'd only really seen a handful of projects 
um, get up, uh, like less than 10. So a, a lot has happened in the community energy space since then. There are more than 70 community energy projects now operating, but back then there were less than 10 operating community energy projects. So we brought some of the most successful uh, project proponents uh, in the solar space together and went, what would be what do you think would be useful to help get more projects off the ground and that was the basis for the guide it was some clear tips and advice and clear documentation of those really successful case studies the thing is is that because the guide was part of so many different uh, elements to the national strategy it got a little bit lost which is where I'm going to hand you back to Tom to explain how this second guide, uh, this second iteration came about. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, so yeah, this, this second version of the guide, um, sorry, uh, really started developing back in 2016. Um, there were two new models that, that succeeded in getting across the line. Um, Pingala, who are looking at the cooperative model, uh, a group that I actually volunteer for, just to give full disclosure, um, and also the Lismore community solar farm model. Pingala was using a cooperative um, and, and also a lease, um, so two new um, instruments in community solar, and Lismore was doing a council community partnership um, and also using, using a loan, uh, again, two new instruments in, in, in investment models for community solar. Um, so Pingala and um, Adam, Adam Blakester at Starfish, it was in fact um, Julian Casby at uh, Pingala and Adam Blakester at, at Starfish Initiatives, um, decided to write their own case studies and start taking the steps towards um, doing an update to the guide to basically install themselves into the guide. Also um, took the opportunity to update the visual decision tree um, that, that was part of the original guide and I want to just make special mention and thanks to Brendan Lim who updated that decision tree uh, uh, by donating his time. Um, during the recent Congress, uh, Community Energy Congress earlier this year, um, there were a couple of things that we started noticing. First of all, there was, there was lack of awareness of the guide. We, we took along uh, large printouts of the decision tree. There was a whole session on, on small scale models of community solar. Um, and what we were overwhelmingly finding was that people weren't aware of the first version of, of the guide. There was also several themes coming out of the Congress. One of those was a strong theme of partnerships and collaborations. And, Really what the guide represents is, is a set of signposts and, and uh, um, instructions for how you can uh, collaborate, adopt or adapt existing models. This is fundamentally one of the key ideas behind the original idea. So the Congress was organized by the Coalition for Community Energy and as part of the Congress activities, uh, there was a, an, an initiative at the end, which was to make sure that the momentum that was generated from the Congress was being capitalized. So it was called, called harnessing the momentum. The idea behind this was to have several quick win strategic initiatives where we could seek a, a small amount of funding and, and achieve a, a rapid outcome. And this was one of the things that was identified and ultimately um, was exceeded in getting funding for. We'll come to the funders in a minute. So um, just want to do some acknowledgements for this guide um, and, and explain more about what it is. It's a, it's a standalone document. It's not been published as, as, a, as a part of a larger document. Um, it was funded by, the update was funded by um, Sustainability Victoria. So we're really thankful to the Victorian government for supporting this through Sustainability Victoria. And as always, this document is a coalition for community energy document. Um, community power agency have been the lead author but we're very thankful for all the collaborators that have that have joined us so those collaborative collaborators include starfish pingala and little sketches brendan lim for the the preliminary update in 2016 all of the existing case studies particularly those that updated their their case studies and made them more relevant and up to date um, and then there's new case studies. So the Hub Foundation um, wrote the case study for MASH. The Macedon Rangers Sustainability Group and the Bendigo Sustainability Group both contributed um, case studies. And there was quite a lot of effort and to and fro involved with that. 
And finally, um, we got some legal advisors involved with this guy because there's a whole new section which talks about the legal, the legal structures. So thank you to Environmental Justice Australia for, for their help. So um, we're going to play a short video from Sustainability Victoria. So um, hopefully the technology works here. Confident that it will. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carl Muller. I'm the interim CEO of Sustainability Victoria. Welcome to the small scale Solar Guide webinar series taking place each Tuesday throughout the course of September. At Sustainability Victoria, we're passionate about making a sustainable and thriving Victoria, mobilising us all to create a better environment now and for our future. We're proud to have supported the Community Power Agency bringing you this webinar series and the latest edition of the Community Solar Guide. Over the four webinars, we'll get to hear some really innovative ideas for behind the meter investment and some great legal frameworks. I hope you enjoy the series. Okay, great. So um, we're a little bit embarrassed that, uh, that um, we were mentioned as community power agency uh, updating the guide. It's the Coalition for Community Energy and, and apologies to C4C for that. It was too late to have the video redone. Now, first, next thing to point out is that um, we've just released version two of the guide and we are about to run a series of four webinars um, and the guide's already been published earlier today. What we're anticipating is that there's going to be suggested ed edits, maybe we've made some mistakes, maybe other people want to collaborate and bring more content into the guide. So if you think you've got something to add to the guide, please let us know, email secretariat at c4c.net.au. Um, and we'll be re releasing a minor update incorporating some of some of those suggested changes in about six weeks time so sometime sometime in October so uh, yeah keep those coming so let's get on with talking about the guide um, so it has the following sections some of which have been updated or most of which has been updated there's a new section as well so the order of these, the order of the table of contents has, has been remodeled so that it flows to make more sense. Um, the introduction and overview um, has actually been enhanced quite significantly, and we've referred to new, new, um, new information that's come to light in the sector since the creation of the first guide. Um, the choosing the right model was always in the guide. We've actually um, brought that forward in, in the table of contents. Um, and crucially, we've, we've actually pointed back to the, the wonderful um, Guide to Community-Owned Renewable Energy for Victorians, which was, which was published by the Victorian government um, earlier this year in 2017? Uh, no, it was a year ago. A year ago in 2016. Um, we've uh, updated the section that talks about the models that work and, and why they work, which is essentially the, the, the intro to the, to the case studies. We've added five new case studies, which we're really excited about. Um, we've updated all of the existing case studies as well, with the sole exception of Sydney Renewable Power Company. Unfortunately, key people just weren't available to do that update, but we're confident that it will be in the October update. There's a, new, uh, there's a whole new section, which is a common legal framework, which sets out a common language and a visual way of describing the different models of donation invest and investment. Um, community solar and um, we're, we're, we're really hopeful this will become a standard way of describing um, the the landscape of community solar and community energy more broadly um, and we'll do a webinar on that next week but hopefully you'll see that it's already showing a great way of comparing and contrasting the differences between the models and finally the host site section remains and and, and, and is relatively unchanged so particularly have a look at that area if you think you've got some knowledge to add to what you've been doing that's successful in finding a host site, please let us know. So as per the first version, the, the aims of the guide are to um, really highlight the, 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 the proven and successful models and, and the techniques that, that are being used by groups out there that have got projects, multiple projects across the line. We want to do that because one of the quickest paths to success is to copy, adopt and adapt what's, what's already been proven to be successful. Um, we want to 
we want to explain the legal structures that, 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 that sit behind the models um, and also talk about why these models work versus certain other models not working so well or perhaps having challenges. Um, we want to help you as a person thinking about setting up a community solar group um, understand which model might be appropriate for your group and it's all going to be based on your local context um, and really give you the first high level steps um, to implementing the most appropriate model. So I think one thing to say about this guide is that it, um, it's fairly broad. It, it aims, aims to cover all of the small scale community solar models in their entirety from investment through to donation through to the multi-household models. Um, but it doesn't necessarily go into those particularly deeply. So there's, there's other resources that have been developed by the people that, that created their guides and there's, there's new resources that are currently under development. And I'll certainly um, mention the Victorian Community Solar Alliance have been recipients of a Victorian New Energy Jobs Fund um, grant, grant and um, they'll be putting a, a, a new toolkit out soon. So in the guide, there's, um, we, we, we reference the, that there are different typologies of community energy broadly. So there's really valuable information that started appearing for the first time in the first version of the guide back in 20, 2015. Um, and then it's been updated quite significantly in the Victorian guide that I mentioned earlier that was released a year ago. And essentially we've got six models that have been identified, six types of um, community energy that, that exist out there in the Australian landscape right now. It's entirely possible we see more being added to the mix. Now, a community project can actually sit in more than one of these models at a time, but it helps us categorize them so that we can understand where, which models are similar to each other, which have, which, have, which have similar key characteristics as each other. Um, I'm not going to read off the slide, but you, you can see that there's a broad spread here. Now, there's one that's missing from here, which is a 100% renewable towns model. Um, we've excluded that from the guide because by definition, um, whole town approaches are, are not small scale and they're not just solar. But every one of the models in this guide, the community solar models in this guide, fits into one of these typologies. So, why are we talking about small scale community solar and why is this, why is this approach been so widely adopted? Pretty much all of the, I'm sorry, pretty much the majority of the community energy groups that have succeeded getting their projects across the line to date have adopted this small scale community solar model. There's, there's, a, there's several reasons for this. And in the guide, in this guide, we, we spell out two key reasons, which is essentially the dynamics of the energy market mean that you're much better off selling your energy to a customer behind the meter and below the load. So what that means is that if we're exporting energy out to the grid, you get a very low wholesale cost or feed-in cost. However, we actually have a very high retail cost by comparison uh, for our houses, for our small, medium and, and small and medium businesses. So if you, can, if you can offset local production of solar, you're going to do much better financially than if you're just doing a pure grid exporting system. Indeed, most of these projects size their systems so that they can minimise the amount of energy, electricity that they're exporting to the grid. And the second major factor is um, we have a renewable energy target in Australia and that creates renewable energy, energy certificates. There's two classes. There's large scale generation certificates um, for solar projects above 100 kilowatts. And then there's small scale technology certificates for projects under 100 kilowatts. Now, the key difference between these is that the small scale certificates are what's known as deemed upfront. So that means that for a 15 year period, the value of the future certificates that are presumed to be generated by that solar farm um, are credited upfront. So it creates what is in effect a approximately 20 to 25% discount upfront. Whereas the large scale certificates uh, uh, need to be redeemed over time and then sold on a, a, an open market. 
So not only is that complicated, but the market's also volatile and it's very difficult to make predictions about what the future prices are going to be. And this creates uncertainty and risk. And if you're dealing with an investment based project, um, then that makes things a whole lot more difficult to, um, to stack up. Federal policy around renewable energy, you know, enhances that or adds to that uh, volatility. Um, and in the guide, we explain more about some of the numbers and some of the dynamics that are, that are playing into all of this. In addition to that, we have increased grid connection costs, the larger uh, a solar system becomes. Um, larger customers tend to be on low tariffs. So one of the things that we see um, uh, early group, groups doing at an early stage is looking for the biggest energy consumer um, in their area and then discovering that actually the rates that they pay for electricity are so low that it's very difficult to make these projects stack up. And then the second, second side of the equation is the, is, the legal consider, is the legal considerations if you're doing an investment model. And the way I like to describe this is that these projects sit at the junction between heavily regulated um, energy industry and a, and a tightly regulated environment if you're seeking investment from, from if you're seeking investment. Now, there's really three options, uh, three ways that you can avoid the onerous regulations that come in, come in play when you um, uh, are seeking investments. These regulations come from the Corporations Act. Um, essentially what you can do is you can try to structure your project so that they've got 20 investors or less. There's this um, arrangement called the Small Scale Offerings Exemptions. It's actually a, a range of measures uh, built into the Corporations Act, which says that if you're making an offering to invest to less than 20 investors, we're gonna assume that you know them, they may be the fa family members, friends, or, or people that have a connection with you. The risk, of, uh, the risk that's being placed on society for projects that, that do this uh, is relatively low, and the impost of having tight regulations, such as having to have a financial services license or to develop a prospectus, would be so high that it would make those make those sorts of offerings um, non-viable. So keep your project to less than 20 investors and you fly under that radar. You can also structure yourself as a private company which has lower compliance costs. The second option we have is to increase above 20 investors, but you need to scale up because as soon as you go above 20 investors, you may need to have a financial services license. You'll almost certainly need some sort of disclosure statement such as a prospectus. And so one of the key examples in this guide is the Sydney Renewable Power Company. They've done exactly that. They've put a four or 500 kilowatt solar system on. They've become a public company. And that larger scale allows them to cover the increased, um, the increased compliance costs and administrative burden. And there's a third option, which is to consider whether or not becoming a cooperative is, is an option for your, for your community. Um, there is some talk about whether cooperatives um, have, uh, have, have are suitable for every community and whether or not we can get access to, a, to the legal advisors. Um, but certainly we've now got one model um, who have proven that it's, that it's possible. Um, I like to say this is horses for courses. So whatever your, your, your organization's motivations are, whatever your values are, you're probably gonna be best to choose a legal structure which best suits those. So when we bring this all together, we end up with a situation where everything is conspiring to say it's just really easy to do small scale solar and it becomes much more difficult when you try to go above 100 kilowatts, above 20 investors. Um, and so we're seeing lots and lots of projects happening. Most of those 70 projects that are on the ground now are small scale solar projects. Um, and, they're, and it's the part of the community energy Australia, in Australia which is, which is most successful to date. Um, there's a whole there's a new section which talks about um, sorry a newly remodeled section which talks about choosing the right model. Um, we've actually pared this down and pointed to the Victorian guide because that guide really talks in in great detail about how to choose the right model. But we do we do pull out some key points. First of all, we're drawing on some of the ideas that are put forward by the. Field Guide to Human-Centred Design from ideo.org, which essentially says that in this simplified model, you need to balance three priorities of what's desirable in the eyes of the, um, 
a consumer of the product and it might be the community energy group and the community what's um, economically viable from a financial perspective and what's technically feasible from an engineering and 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 uh, technology perspective so essentially think of this guide as being uh, as being a set of signposts to what's been proven to work already. Um, therefore, what do we know is much more likely to be viable and feasible. Um, we do touch on the motivators and benefits of community energy and, and that will, that along with the, uh, the Victorian guide will, will help you um, figure out what is going to be most desirable for your community. So we're now going to start talking about some of the um, some of the case studies that are in the guide. Um, so what we've introduced in this guide is we've actually um, categorised them into investment, donation, and multi-household models. So in the first guide under the investment category, there were three case studies. It was Repower, Clear Sky, and the Sydney Renewable Power Company. So we've added in Liz, uh, Pingala and Lismore now. So they're in this order for a particular reason. Um, Repower Shoalhaven were, were, the, were, were, were the pioneers. They, were, they created the first community solar model for investors. Um, they only just beat Clear Sky, but I believe they, were, they just got in there first. So they come first. Um, at the same time, Clear Sky were independently developing their model. And these two models have a very similar structure to each other. They both use what's known as a, a special purpose vehicle, which is an investment entity that's created especially for the project. And it's that entity that houses the 20 investors that fly under the radar of the 20 investor limit. So with Repower, they use a, a proprietary or a PTY LTD company um, as their special purpose vehicle and Clear Sky use a trust model. So there's no winner here. These are just different approaches and they're both proving to be extremely successful with, with very many projects now across the line. Um, Clear Sky, I should point out as well, falls into the community developer partnership typology of community energy. So they've forged a very close relationship with a particular solar company. And that's meant that they've, had, they've, they've been able to avoid doing a bunch of the stuff that the other groups have had to do. Um, in particular, doing the solar sales, solar assessment, and, and, the, um, uh, and the managing of the solar system over time. So their commercial partner does that for them. So these are two pioneering, very small scale models. Um, and then the reason we put Pingala and Lismore after those two is because they're of a similar similar type and a similar scale. So Pingala was actually derived directly from Repower and clearly inspired by Clear Sky as well. Um, and what Pingala decided to do was that rather than create a, a single special purpose vehicle for every project, that it might be more efficient to have a reusable vehicle that be, could be used for every single project. Um, and so they decided to form a cooperative and in doing so became the first, you know, cooperative based investment community solar project. Um, they also, unlike the previous two, which are using power purchase agreements, they also um, you know, pioneered the use of a lease. So there's two unique um, or additional instruments that are being added into the landscape with Pingala. Lismore continued along the special purpose vehicle route but they did two key innovations. One was they partnered with the council. And so their partnership with the council model is a really interesting uh, idea. And it's a great way if you know that you've got a, a council that, that can support you. Uh, and the second thing they did is they, they used a, a loan model. I would just jump I just in. see because your hand was covering it. Yeah. I'd just jump in and say that a lot of community energy groups automatically think that they will go and partner with the council. Um, Partnering with council is can be really great, but it can also be really hard. Um, just wanted to put that as a caveat out there because mm. um, you have to get uh, you, to to get the agreement up. You have to pass through so many different levels of the organisation, from the councillors and CEO on down. So that's just something to be aware of. Councils are highly siloed organisations, and then one of those departments will be the finance department, and they tend to have a one-dimensional perspective. 
So I think use, use the council partnership model if you know your council uh, can push these things through. And if you can, then it's a great way of getting projects happening. And then the last one here is, is the existing model, the Sydney Renewable Power Company. This model was created specifically for installing solar panels on the roof of the redeveloped um, uh, International Convention um, and Exhibition Centre in, in Sydney. Um, and as mentioned earlier, they, they, they've used an, an unlisted public company. The scale is, is large, is, is, is a fair bit larger. They're probably approaching the threshold of, of being defined as a small scale model. Um, but certainly they're a really compelling um, way to approach a, a larger behind the meter project because um, they, can, they can offer their investment to, well, pretty much an unlimited number of um, uh, unlimited number of investors. So those are the investment models. Now, it's important to understand that in three weeks time on the 26th of September, there will be a webinar specifically on the investment model. So we'll be delving into those in more detail on that date. So then the second category is donation models. Um, in the first guide, we had Karina's revolving fund. So donate, donors provide funds um, that, that's used to provide low interest, zero interest loans to local not-for-profit and community organizations. Because it's a loan, the funds actually come back into Karina. So donated by donors who don't expect their money back, yet the money comes back into Karina's revolving fund. And this slightly wonderful model means that for every dollar that's donated, it gets used again and again and again. So Karina have now calculated that a dollar donated to the first project has actually been used more than two and a half times already. Um, and we're really, really excited in this guide to be able to um, showcase the Macedon Ranges Renewable Energy Fund, um, which is actually uh, very similar to the Carina model, um, but it, um, it has two key innovations. First of all, it, uh, it kick-started the fund by taking a grant from the government. So if you're in a situation where you think you can attract grant funding to pay for solar panels, um, then you can structure things in a way to actually to kickstart a, a, a renewable energy fund for your community. That sounds easy. I mean, this is not a mean. This is no mean feat to uh, secure grant funding, and it's probably uh, a model for groups who have a solid track record in the community already. Perhaps have done projects, uh, whether they're in energy or not, doesn't matter. But they already have a track record of successful project delivery. Um, plus, you need to know that there are grants available. The second innovation that Macedon brought in is they, um, they created a, a power purchase agreement. So they didn't use a, a loan like Karina did. They created a power purchase agreement. But what that's specifically for is for a landlord who has tenants. And the land, they've set up a microgrid, an embedded microgrid. So they've got a single um, utility meter, all of the tenants are then billed by the landlord for their share of the use of, of electricity because there's a bunch of sub-meters in place. So this is one of the first examples in community, community solar of an embedded microgrid situation. So some really interesting stories coming out of that model. Likewise, there's gonna be a webinar on the 19th of September. So we'll again go into more detail on, on donation models. And then finally, we've got these Sorry, not finally. And then the last model, the grouping we have is multi-household. So the first guide had uh, Darabin Solar Savers. Really pleased to see that Solar Savers has expanded significantly since the Darabin trial, and it's now being expanded across 20, 22 councils across Victoria, representing, I believe it's many thousands of households that are looking to be getting access to um, low interest loans, and particularly using uh, a partnership with a council which offer a rates-based payment mechanism. This arrangement that Solar Savers brings allows very many households to get access to solar and it, and it leverages the trust that councils have, some of the institutional capabilities that council has um, to make that more likely to happen and more likely to happen in a way that benefits lower income households. Um, so the first example was for pensioners and and I think there's going to be continued focus on, on low-income households as that model expands. 
Then we have the MASH model, which is out of uh, Castlemaine and the Hub Foundation. Um, originally more, um, mass, uh, what's, what's it stand for? It was standing for more Australian solar households, um, is essentially a case study of a bulk buy model. So bulk buys are really popular. There's, prob there's probably dozens of them, very many dozens of them out there. So it seemed a bit missing to not include them in the guide. And this is a very successful uh, model, um, MASH work fairly closely with councils, uh, not so much in a partnership, but in a supporting role. Um, and they've had, they've had a lot of success. So if someone wants to look at doing bulk buys, MASH is a great place to start um, figuring out what, what's involved in doing a, in doing a, um, a bulk buy. We, we're not delving into these in detail, so there's no um, specific webinar on these models. And then finally, we have what is not really a model type, but a hybrid approach. So really excited that Bendigo Sustainability Group have given us their case study. Um, what, they've, what they've effectively done is they've got an adaptive approach. So they've plucked and choose different elements from different models to um, flexibly deliver the type of project that's needed for every single customer that they do. They started out with donations, they've then added, they continued along the, the sort of donations path, they've added in different ways of funding that, including bank financing, a bank loan, um, and in the future soon they'll be including, um, um, <laughs> sorry, there's a bit of background noise here, it's a bit distracting. In the future soon they'll be including um, investment models. So Nikki, what were you going to uh, say? So we've just had a really good question here. Do these models apply uh, from when is it, uh, from someone, sorry, I, I can't pronounce your name. Um, do these models specifically apply to households only? I'm looking at schools. Yeah, so the multi-householder models um, don't apply to households only. So m many of the bulk buyers um, have been able to offer their um, discounted solar um, offering to not just households but also to small energy users. So a small a small school system on the roof of a on a childcare centre on the roof of a community centre. These are these have all been done, and I believe they've been done with the Mash example and others. Um, and then I, what I'd say is that all of the other models that we've described are good for small organisations. So small businesses, medium-sized businesses, not-for-profit organisations. And we come to that a little bit more in detail. Our experience of schools to date is because um, is, it depends whether they're government-owned or not. Typically, if they're government-owned, they're hard to engage with because their power is purchased centrally through the state government. If they're private, um, then there's opportunities. So again, if they're a Catholic of Catholic school, often they're, they're, the power is also purchased centrally. Um, child cares are really excellent, and we know that if Karina um, has uh, done solar projects on a number of child cares. Uh, as as has the people solar who aren't showcased in this guide, but a very very successful model. I think schools are becoming increasingly popular. There's more and more projects happening. All right, apparently you guys can't hear the sound of angle grinders in the background, so that's good. We'll keep going. Um, all right, so one of the things that we included in the guide and has, has, has now been expanded to include the new models is this key features table. So across two pages in, 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 this, in this simple table structure, we're able to compare all of these models with each other, covering off these, these sort of main categories that make up the rows. So if you want a really quick summary, you can jump to this part of the document and, and rapidly understand what, what the key features are of each one of the projects. At this point, I should, you know, should point out that this guide isn't necessarily intended to be read in a linear way. Um, it's entirely possible that you want to jump to read a particular case study, and that makes a lot of sense you may be wanting to understand a lot more detail around the options with regards to legal structures and the types of legal agreements that underpin uh, the, the, the different models. And there's a whole legal section now that you can turn to to rapidly skill up on that side and before you come back and read the case studies and make more sense of those. As mentioned, there's a common legal framework section. So this is going to be, uh, again, a webinar happening soon on the next week on the 12th of September. 
Um, and really excited to have this section of the guide. It's, uh, it's a common language that we use to describe each one of the legal entities that exists within the models and all of the agreements that underpin the models. All right, we've got some pretty bad background noise, but we're um, just checking to see what we can do about it. Um, now, what we've been able to do as well is we've actually used this common legal structure to create a diagram of every single model. So there's a, there's a part of this section called the gallery. And in the gallery, we outline all of the different uh, donation investment models. And for the first time, we can visually see the difference as we flick from page to page in the gallery. Um, and uh, it's a great way of describing the models uh, be, and, and to step beyond just words on a page. We can actually look at, look at a visual representation as we discuss it. So as I mentioned, there'll be a webinar and that will be deep diving into that next week. Okay, apparently that noise is coming through. I'm just gonna make sure that I'm speaking close to the microphone. It's gonna be really disruptive if we try and move ourselves and there's nothing we can do about it. The last section in the guide is um, finding a host site. Um, this section covers off the technical uh, features to look for, technical characteristics, the, the, the financial characteristics and the investment security characteristics. You need to have these elements right, otherwise the project's not gonna be viable. Um, but it's equally valid to, at the same time, look at what are the organizational motivations. Increasingly, the um, donation and investment models that have made projects happen are realizing that they are actually looking for a sort of organizational fit between themselves and, and their host sites. Um, those ones where there is a fit tend, tend to go through a lot more smoothly. We're getting some good feedback saying the noise isn't a problem. I think it's just a little distracting for us at this end. Okay, so we'll good. keep powering through. <laughs> We're actually getting close to the end, which is great. Do we have any questions? Uh, so we do have one question coming through, but if people uh, come through so far, if people want to uh, jump in and add questions to the chat right now, I will take some. Um, so the first question is, what about apartments? Do any of the models apply to apartments? No, they do not, unfortunately. The Macedon Rangers model, although it's a donation model, it has that characteristic of having an embedded microgrid. So um, I would suggest that anybody looking at apartments has a, a bit of a closer look at the Macedon Rangers model, but also has a, has a look at the... Um, sunny tenants. Solar tenants? Sunny tenants? Y y yes. I was actually thinking of the apartment building. Uh, um, Stucco. Stucco housing cooperative model. So we don't have a case study on it, but there is a bit of information out there around that. Um, feel free to send an email to secretariat at c4c.net.au if you want to know more about that, that particular model. We can point you to the right people that will be able to help you with that. Uh, we don't yet have any more questions. People, don't be shy. We've got 15 minutes to go, so what questions or comments would you like to add? Okay. Um, we'll take that as an indication that we've been fairly clear. Um, just to confirm, we can get help with the funding models at what email exactly? Sorry, that would be secretariat at c4ce.net.au. And I've just brought the slide back up on the screen so you can see that. Um, another question is, have there been any on-farm examples? Yes, there have. Repower Shoalhaven has done two dairy farms so far. Um, we know of a number of community energy groups that are looking at mm, larger scale solar projects on farms. Um, we haven't included them in the guide because those models aren't proven yet, but, but I think Repower Shoalhaven are the people to talk to for engaging with farmers. Um, can we expand on the point about working with government schools? I seem to suggest that it was hard. I guess the first thing to point out here is that 
government schools depends on which state you're in because schools are funded and administered at the state level. So there's no clean single answer that we can give you here. Um, but there are some things to be aware of is that m in most states, funding tends to be centralised for energy, which means the school doesn't necessarily have a budget for electricity, um, but it's, it's managed centrally. So one of the unintended consequences of installing solar on a school might be that you reduce, that you, that you think you're going to be providing savings and therefore increasing the budgetary spend of the school, but instead you're actually saving money to the state government. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but if that's not your intention, then you need to be aware of that up front. Um, schools uh, tend to have constrained decision making around purchasing and um, uh, making uh, spending decisions like that. And that's because of the fact that they're um, government funded. So sometimes it can be difficult to get a decision across the line. I don't want to discourage anyone from looking at schools. In fact, there's some really, um, there's some really uh, exciting and increasingly successful initiatives coming around. Uh, which, are, which are proving that schools can be tackled and can be done successfully. Uh, so there was a question from Tassia, thanks Tassia, about where can we post the web address of where we can access the guide. I did post it early on in the chat. Um, I will repost it into the chat right now, um, but uh, maybe we'll just add a slide about it do you want to yeah the, the the web address is a little bit um is a little bit awkward um so we don't we don't have a clean address for it at this stage so i'll just pull the web address up on my browser and we can have a look at that what that looks like um let's see if we'll see all oh, right there it is and i'll put that into a slide and we'll come back to slideshow and make that available Oh, where am I going here? Yeah, sorry for the jumping around. Um, okay, so some more questions. We've got more questions. Uh, so just a, a case study example. Menai Public High School has a 99 kilowatt system, apparently the result of three years of fundraising efforts, efforts by the school principal. Um, thanks for that. Um, so... A question from Chris Sanderson. To what extent do you think any of these models might offer useful advice to shire-wide applications such as zero emissions Byron? Can you ask that question again? Sorry, I'm multitasking here. To what extent do you think any of these models might offer useful advice to shire-wide applications such as zero emission Byron? I think they all um, could play an important role. Um, I can speak for myself. I'm definitely not an expert in the 100% or whole of town approach, but it's obvious that what those approaches are comprised of is a multitude of actions that in their entirety lead to achieving the 100% renewable energy, zero, zero emissions or, or whatever target that town is aiming for. So potentially any organisation doing 100% towns would be able to get value out of each one of the approaches in this guide. Um, we also have at the end of October, Taryn Lane um, doing a webinar on her Churchill Fellowship looking at um, examples of 100% renewable uh, towns and shires uh, from Europe. So look out for that one. Um, a bunch of other questions, one from Angela. Is there a guide on the soft skill required to set up and organise a community energy group? Well, I'd probably say the two closest examples would be the Victorian Guide and Community Power Agency's How To Guide. Um, I think you'll find plenty of information in those guides. I, I know that you, Angela, are already familiar with them, so I, I suspect that I'm actually landing short of answering your question. Okay. Um... Another question, just reading it verbatim. Do you think, from Gavin, do you think we've reached the point where we should also be marketing community energy to existing residential and small business solar users? Because perhaps now is the time for people to expand their systems or add batteries. Um, I think the answer to that is yes. And I think that the different organisations across the country who are doing bulk buys, like MASH, like Farming the Sun, uh, like Sun Crowd are doing just that. Um, I think if you are you know, looking to set up a bulk buy type of model, I think that's a really good option. Um, there is 
there aren't actually that many proportionally small business users that already have solar on their, uh, their roof. So I think if you're looking at the, the larger sort of com still small scale, but larger community solar projects um, or models, uh, you're probably starting from scratch rather than, and it's worth starting to, from scratch rather than going to an existing um, place that has solar. But, you know, if the solar system looks small, then now might be a good time. So, yeah. Swings and roundabouts. I'm certainly aware of one model that's, that's that's looking at going on the roof of an existing what you might call small business, um, who've got a very small system on their roof, and they're going to completely cover the roof because their energy needs have gone up. Um, a question from Richard: Do behind the meter models de normally deliver a cost saving to the host, so they make investment sense for the investor and the host? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we need to be careful of when we're talking about donation models, and even to some extent the, sorry, investment models, and even to some extent the donation models. The reality is, is that still today, the, the, the business case for these projects is somewhat marginal. Um, and when, when we talk about going and pitching this idea to potential host sites, it's important not to oversell the cost saving element. Um, cost savings can also be sliced and diced and you know presented in different ways. Um, there's the there's the most obvious dimension is 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 having a community solar on the roof of my business going to cut my energy bills immediately from day one. There's a second dimension which is not so obvious, which is will having a community energy project on my roof insulate me against future energy price rises? And clearly they will do that. And then the third dimension is most of these projects will gift the solar panels to the host site at the end of the term, which is probably going to be five to 10 years typically. And so solar panels have a use, useful life of 25 years. I'm sure most, most people know that. But if you map out the projected savings over that period of time, there's massive savings to be made. So will it save money up front? In some cases, will it save a huge amount of money up front? Probably unlikely. Um, and in some examples, you know, maybe it might even just be the same. But the benefits beyond that are substantial. And one of the things that I'd like to do is to actually include in the host site section at the back of the document, more information about how to actually sell to a host site customer. How do you actually pitch this idea more successfully, um, stepping away from just a single dimension conversation about energy prices and, and saving money. So. Collaborators, please step forward if you want to contribute to that section. You think you might know about that sort of stuff. Um, so a question from Hope. Householders options to protect the environment. They're based in Toowoomba. They did a bulk purchase in 2012 and they're thinking about doing one next year. What case studies available um, might be available to help them improve their project proposal? Certainly the MASH example is worth looking at. And um, well, that's the only one in the guide, which is a pure bulk buy. Um, the Solar Savers has bulk buy, bulk buy elements to it. Um, it is done in very close partnership with the council and there's certain elements of that that may not work in Queensland. Um, I would suggest that you um, uh, get in touch with us via secretariat at c4c.net.au and we can point you to some other groups that are doing bulk buys. The one that immediately comes to mind is Adam Blakester and Starfish, Starfish. Initiatives and, yeah. and uh, Lismore and um, New England Farming the Sun. And not a million miles away from Toowoomba, so that might be helpful. Yep. Um, we're coming to the end of our questions. Um, one from Chris, uh, how far off is the microgrid technology that would allow sales from a solar garden? Hmm. Do you want to have a go? Look, my, my thoughts on solar gardens is that technology wise, we have all the building blocks required, um, with the possible of exception of a bit of software to, to support a billing system. But even, even then, having said that, we do have billing systems that exist within the electricity retailers, and we do have third-party billing systems that exist in the US where solar gardens are extremely popular and very prevalent. So, 
Yeah, I, mean, I think if you're talking about an embedded microgrid and, and we're, we're considering ways of selling electricity to houses within those environments, then um, maybe we're talking about sort of sub-metering solutions. There's so much happening in this space, it's really hard to keep track of. Um, and this is starting to enter the realm where we find technologies such as blockchain um, coming into the space. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a newly launched uh, marketplace for energy sales that supports this sort of thing. Um, so we've had two questions, um, which have been, what, about, what are the differences across the various states in Australia to be mindful of, if any? Yeah, okay. Um, well, first of all, cooperation, well, from a legal perspective, Corporations Act is national, so that's uniform. Cooperative laws are state-based although there is a harmonisation of cooperative laws across pretty much every state and territory now, with the real exception of Queensland. Yeah, so basically if you're in Queensland and you're thinking of doing a, a Pingala-based model, a cooperatives-based model, have a look at how your co-op's law differs from the national law and or encourage the Queensland government to adopt the national law, as yeah. they said they would. From an energy market perspective, it's also relatively uniform. We have a national energy market, a uniform you know, a set of laws, but there are state-based variations, such as in Victoria, where they've overlaid their own sub-rules across some of the NEM rules. And also that the NEM doesn't apply, of course, in Northern Territory and Western Australia. Where there are completely different systems, correct. Yeah. So a lot of the um, community, all of the non-household based community energy models that we've been talking about today uh, mostly require a retail licence exemption. Um, well, they do if you're using a power purchase agreement. And so you can get a power purchase a, a retail licence exemption fairly easily in New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, ACT. Um, things are a little bit more difficult in Victoria and um, talk to the um, Victorian Community Solar Alliance. They've been doing a lot of advocacy around this space. Um, but things might be different in Western Australia and uh, Northern Territory. Two of the case, sure. sorry to talk over you, two of the case studies are from Victoria groups that are using power purchase agreements and they've got retail licence exemptions. So it is possible, just might be a bit more difficult. Yeah. Any more questions or can we go more into state-based differences? One thing that comes to mind is the um, solar savers model does depend on rates-based um, financing, which means that a special levy, a special charges are applied to rates. We know for some previous work done by the Institute for Sustainable Futures, that that's not possible in New South Wales um, because of the state-based local government act, act. And it may be the case that other states have similar constraints. Yeah, so again, that's going to be need for advocacy if we want to be addressing that. Yeah. Um, there's one more question that's come up a number of times um, and I've missed it, I'm sorry, which is, uh, have many of the examples incorporated battery storage? I know there of are two. a few, yeah. <laughs> I know of two. So um, the first is Karina has one of their revolving fund models was for a community garden. So it was actually an off-grid solar and battery storage system. Um, also, a number of the bulk buys are starting to do household battery storage. We haven't seen any of the projects doing a sort of special purpose vehicle or with commercial solar um, host sites or customers um, using batteries yet, but I think that'll probably change in the next year or so. Um, let us know if you know about more examples, but those are the ones that we know about. Yeah, there's a there's an ongoing conversation about whether or not <coughs> battery batteries business case stacks up, and I think that like many things, there's no simple answer to it. One of the ways in which the business case case can be made to stack up more easily is by using the batteries to shave off peak demand and peak usage charges for a business, and I think there's a lot of groups looking at whether or not they can do that. And I think the thing to say is that there, and this is an, a, an idea that um, the folks at Repower Shoalhaven really talk about a lot, which is that there's levels of complexity and levels of innovation. So the first level of innovation is just adopting an existing model for your own context in your own community. Then taking, so doing one successful project and then they go, oh, what can we do next? Um, and so batteries might be, something to do in your second project or your third project. Um, 
and thinking about the idea that there's going to be multiple iterations um, and versions, hopefully, of, of doing community energy projects if you're going to go down the small scale route. Um, that it's it's very flexible and, and very replicable, um, but you might want to start simple, just do some solar, because once you start to incorporate batteries, the financial calculations get more complicated. That's not to say don't do it, just be aware that it's going to have added levels of complexity. I really like that that way of thinking about it, and it also highlights that as a community group yourself, you should be thinking, what, what do we want to do for the long term? Do, do we just want to do one project? Or do we want to perhaps achieve something bigger and do multiple projects across a range of different types over a long, a long period of time? And if you just want to do one project, then maybe you don't even need, need to adopt an existing model. What we're seeing so much happening now is groups are just partnering with each other. And so some of the examples of that would be Karina have partnered with you know, a range of different groups to, to just do projects in partnership, as well as helping other groups closely adopt their model. Um, Clear, Clear Sky are doing that. Certainly Repower are doing that. Um, the group that I volunteer for, Pingala, hasn't done it, but we're keen to, to um, work with communities within Sydney. Really collaboration for communities that want to do something but don't necessarily want to do the whole whack is, is really a big piece here. So... We're at three minutes past seven. There are sort of two or three final questions. Um, maybe I'm just going to say them and answer them live and then Perfect. we're going to wrap up. So um, am I aware of any uh, projects using virtual net metering? Um, should we just be um, springing a line across the road from a school to, to access new members? And what about this landlord and tenant fee? Um, so... <laughs> I think two of the things that are really important to know is that the majority, all of these community solar projects that we've been talking about, they just have the members of it get benefit through, um, if it's an investment-based project, through a financial return, a dividend or a, or a member return in the case of a, a cooperative. Um, they're not getting, they're not involved from an electricity purchasing point of view. That's where we get into the solar garden or virtual net metering territory. It hasn't been done in Australia yet. Um, we're working on it at Community Power Agency, but it's got higher levels of complexity, even than, you know, adding battery storage, because um, you need to partner with a retailer and the retailer needs to see a financial case in doing that. And so, you know, a lot of these models uh, and a lot of uh, the ingenuity of community energy groups in developing small-scale community solar models have been going, well, unlike other countries, we don't have policies that have been hugely supportive or specifically supportive of community energy. Of course, there's been funding made available and resource development, and we are very thankful for Sustainability Victoria, but we don't have a feed-in tariff like in Scotland or virtual net metering legislation like in the US. So these models work within the sort of existing market arrangement, and they're, you know, uh, world leading in a way, um, ways of doing community energy without that policy support. But that means that their financials are harder um, and doing things that are perhaps more socially beneficial like solar gardens become even more um, financially marginal. And that's where we need to start to get um, governments involved. Um, so watch this space, but in the meantime, really encourage you to get on with um, doing things that are possible um, and workable and then adopting and adapting and innovating based of building off that. Um, that said, you know, innovation and trying things is always a good idea, but, you know, getting runs on the board is something that we've learnt um, fairly rapidly is a way to, to grow this community energy sector for all of us. That's great. And I think that that question is also a really good segue to wrap things up. Uh, next week, we're going to be delving into this whole new section, the common legal framework and the gallery of, of legal models. Um, what that gallery can be used for is to show just how much innovation is happening in this space. Um, so join us at the same time on Tuesday next week. And um, Tell everyone you know about this guide. One of the uh, one of the things with the launch of the last one is that just wasn't people didn't know about it because it was it was in the shadow of the national community energy strategy. So please share it. Please get the word out there. 
Um, we hope that it can be something that, pe that groups use to actually make projects happen and, and more of them. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.